Hi, I'm Paco Nathan with O'Reilly Media, and we're here at JupyterCon. It's a pleasure to be speaking with Lorena Barba, uh, who's a professor at George Washington University. Um, Lorena, you have been one of the early people applying Jupyter IPython in education. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about like how you got started on that? I got started because I met Fernando Perez at a, at a workshop. He gave a talk about IPython notebook. It was before the Jupyter name. And uh, I saw it and I thought immediately, I want to use this in my class right now. And um, I accosted him at the uh, coffee break and I said, help me install this right away. He got it installed in my laptop in a few minutes and uh -huh. I, was, uh, and I, I, I had a flight that very evening, a long haul flight. And I uh, you know, took it with me, immediately started hacking uh, on the flight and uh, figuring out how to incorporate it in my classroom coming up soon. And I, haven't, I ha have used it in my classes since then. Now, the kind of coursework that your students, your classes are working with, uh, this is in um, fluid dynamics, mechanical I did a class or? in computational fluid dynamics, yes. Okay. That was for engineering students at the master's level. Um, that was in 2012, 2013. I um, then I moved to I was at Boston University at the time I moved to uh, GW and I taught a class in um, uh, aerodynamics okay. so that was a class it was a very good interesting experience because the aerodynamics class uh, traditionally that class is classical aerodynamics is taught really pen and paper right. um, uh, lots of equations derivations a lot of it's, it's a really classical topic and it can be very arid and boring for the students and I decided I wanted to do it computationally. Completely upended the idea of how to teach that topic by doing it computationally and it was a very good experience to see how the students interacting within the notebook were getting to some of the concepts that previously would have been presented like deriving an equation and drawing pictures on the board. Are, are Students, graduate students, say when they're doing research, when they're doing lab work, These are they beginning to use Jupyter now in this too? Yes, yes. The students in my classroom that I was just describing, they are uh, master students mostly, so they're not doing research. Okay. In in the with the research students, um, I incorporated Jupyter in my research um, workflow immediately, and we we are using Jupyter every day for internal reporting, for organizing ideas, for organizing results before we figure out whether they're ready for publication or not. Um, constructing these narratives before we write a paper. And, and just to give us some context, I, I really appreciated getting to visit your lab and there's a lot of GPUs there. There's a lot of number crunching going on. So I, I can imagine that the notebooks are capturing the, the theory and, and some observations and results, but there's also probably a lot of systems work. To we, get have, we have other code that, that runs outside the notebook, okay. of course, that produces the simulations, and sometimes those runs are pretty intensive. Yeah. Not only the ones that are running on the GPU workstations in the lab, but also some are running on a, in a cluster, the university cluster. Right. And even now we're using some cloud resources as well for simulations. Ah. But the results come in often in very raw form, and there's a lot of post-processing that happens in computational science. And uh, all of that now we're doing in, in the notebook and in a way that ideally would be reproducible. So before, there are some alternatives for doing post-processing with um, uh, tools, uh, plotting tools that some researchers may choose to use through a GUI. Right. And we want to eliminate all of that uh, uh -huh. and do it programmatically with Python so that the process of showing an aspect of the data set in a certain view or something uh, can also be reproduced by someone else if they have access to the raw data. And so that, that's been a lot of the theme of the conference. Certainly a lot of uh, what you presented today in an excellent keynote is about reproducible science. Yes. And, and really what, what are the limitations? What do we need to work on? Or who has even been doing this? Uh, you mentioned research from Stanford, right? Going back into the 90s. Yes, that's uh, the work of Joan Clairbout, the granddaddy, I would say, of the reproducible research movement, uh, who was calling 
the, the community to do reproducible research back in the 90s. And the first appearance of the phrase reproducible research in print that I could find was from 1992, a okay. conference paper he had delivered uh, and the Geophysics Society uh, meeting at that time. Uh, the paper describes all of their processes a little bit dated because the tools of the time, 92, imagine I, they were using Make. And, I was going to say they're using Unix. <laughs> yeah, and probably all Unix, Unix. Yeah, yeah. raw Unix and Make <laughs> and so on. Uh, but the, the ideas, the core ideas were there. And then this group published a paper in Computing in Science and Engineering, an IEEE AIP joint uh, publication in 2000, where they explain a little bit their, their view. Already this was starting to permeate to other groups. Uh, David Donahoe in statistics um, oh, took, their, took their methods and um, uh, he, his PhD students started also adopting the idea of reproducible research and he has published quite a lot on the topic. Um, but it, you know, the tools were, were, were a little clunky, I guess, at the time. It's now more, um, not, n still some researchers resist a bit because there are some uh, advanced uh, skills required, but it's not as hard as it might have been in the 90s, is, clearly. Is, is that more a matter of wanting to be careful about how people interpret or is it, as far as the skills required to work with, with reproducing an effort, is it, do some researchers have concerns about people who don't really understand the implications trying to interpret it the wrong way? Sometimes that is a concern uh, in, some, in some fields, and there have been horror stories of somebody yeah. putting out their code and it not being documented enough and not being ah. used well, and that publication comes out that is actually wrong. Yeah. Um, there have been horror stories of code being put out there that had mistakes, you know, a uh, flipped sign or something and resulting in uh, incorrect publications. But if the code is not put out there, then the mistake wouldn't have been found. Know, the bug yeah. might have not been found. So it is important to put the code out there, even, even though some people do resist. The issues about skills are more on the side of when you're doing the research, when you're carrying out that research, um, using version control, good code uh, development practices, software engineering practices, and uh, code testing and documentation. That a lot of the researchers, the, the graduate students working in computational science are not trained right. uh, properly yeah. in those tools. There are software engineering tools that have to be adopted in computational science as tools of the trade. In that sense, efforts like software carpentry have been very influential for trying to break that, that, uh, that barrier. Um, but more, we need, we need more adoption and, and, and more understanding of, of how to make this standard uh, training for graduate students at the universities. It, it seems like, I'm going back to an earlier conversation we had this morning, uh, it seems like that's an opportunity for iteration to be involved too. One of the themes you had from your talk was about not just putting the resources out there and allowing somebody to push the button, because that is not a dialogue. Correct. Instead, we need, we need more. I mean, yes. Can you describe that a bit more? Well, what reproducibility is really about is when uh, a group is conducting research, um, they want to put it out there in a form that maybe another researcher or another group might be able to not only reproduce what that um, analysis uh, conducted by, but build from it, right? right? And to accomplish that, you have to, this is all a, a, a process of, of relationship building between the researchers. Right, right. Um, and uh, the, the, the tools can help, but you, as a researcher, want to anticipate uh, a conversation that you will have virtually with other researchers that want to build from your work and, um, and, and, and take responsibility for, um, uh, it's a commitment. You make a right. commitment yeah. to do the work in a form that will enable the other researchers to comprehend it, inspect it, uh, come to trust it, and build from it. Uh, what I was trying to say in my keynote, one of the main points is we can have tools that facilitate uh, reproducible research, but we cannot relinquish the responsibility as the humans right, in, right. In, this, in this process to, uh, to make commitments to work reproducible, reproducibly, to, uh, to 
there's like a level of accountability there. Yes, yes. It's not just a one way. You you can't just leave it to the machine. Yeah. uh, To to to. You can't give the, the computers the responsibility of uh, re- reproducible research. It has to re- remain on us. Right. When we must use the computers as our helpers in right. this whole process. Right. Augmenting. Not, yes. Not replacing. Uh, interesting. So uh, now here we are at JupyterCon, but I can imagine that what you've been working on is a much broader scope of tools, learning tools, different types of interoperability of, of what researchers and educators do. Um, I, I know that you've been involved with Open edX. Um, are there some areas of integration between some of this other kind of tooling and what we're seeing now with Jupyter? Right. In education, certainly I, I have a, a big interest in open education and um, not only creating open educational resources, but creating the communities and yeah. putting uh, course uh, experiences out there for people to have access to as well. And in that, I, I did... Uh, uh, create a massive open online course, a MOOC, in 2014 in Numerical Methods for Engineers and that uh, has been hosted in OpenEdX. OpenEdX is an open source software that allows you to create a learning platform on the cloud for students to uh, come and join and follow a course and participate by not only uh, reading, accessing the materials, video or text, uh, but um, doing assessments. It has right. a lot of very good assessment tools built in that you can uh, create, you know, design a, a course around. This uh, has been live since then, we, and I con- people continue to sign up for the course even oh, though I'm not actually actively now uh, uh, running it. Um, uh, as a, as a course, but uh, for example, the last time I checked, only a few days back, there was like 8,200 people registered wonderful, in, wonderful. in the course, <laughs> which is incredible because this is just one professor with a couple of, I, I did have a couple of collaborators that were interested in this idea that were at other universities adopting the course and, col- and contributing as well to the materials. Uh, but a small scale effort compared to, say, edX itself, edX.org, that has, you know, 100 universities and the whole might of MIT and Harvard behind it, right? Uh, and so, th- yeah, they can have 100,000 people in a course and 5 million users, but this is a completely different scale. Nevertheless, it's still massive scale in the sense that this is reaching thousands of students, right? it's thousands of users. Um, so it's still another skill than what you reach in the classroom, uh, certainly. Open edX, uh, it, you know, it's a learning management system and a platform for delivering courses online. And I create the materials in Jupyter okay. and on GitHub. So the question that you're asking is how, how to integrate these two. Right, and yeah. I've been thinking about this since 2014 when I created this course. And without perhaps resources or time, for it, I haven't really made progress on it, but I, I have some clear ideas. What I would like to see is I could cr- still create my course on Jupyter, but this should be a way to, like an MB convert uh, oh, step, okay, you yeah. know, deliver. Yeah. Uh, the presentation. Uh, uh, so yeah. make a conversion to the, uh, to, to, to push the content into Open edX. Yeah. Uh, Open edX, the, the underlying format there is XML, really. So there's, uh, there. This is a technical question, and it can, surely it can be done. But more importantly, uh, so authoring in Jupyter, like you know, you do guys, in, you, you do it in O'Reilly, right? And then pushing to the platform, yeah. and then uh, c- creating an, an experience without having to duplicate the content, of course. Right. But then adding, uh, when when you add assessments, you can use all of the built-in OpenEdX assessments. But in addition, you might want to also assess code, uh, which we can do in the Jupyter Hub experience with the NB Grader extension. So then the question is how could you perhaps use NB Grader as an external grader for open edX? I have been in contact with someone in, in UCSD who has some experience on that. I will I'm, I'm looking forward to see what they've done Fantastic. and to bring that you know to bring that to the next level, try to incorporate and, and make that public. Uh, if we do any make any progress on it, of course it will be open source. And uh, and I think that would be really really powerful to 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 use these two uh, to use um, Jupiter as authoring and Jupiter Hub and MB Grader for testing and uh, auto grading and also take advantage of the 
a wonderful platform that um, the delivery at scale ed edX has done. Yeah. yeah, with all of the registrations so, and all of the discussion yeah. boards and all of the other stuff that that provides. So, so, so complimentary there. Um, preparing a course like that, what is your uh, what's your experience as far as the, the level of effort or the amount of investment you have to make preparing the materials versus preparing the assessment? I mean, these are all difficult things to do. What, what, is there a kind of a balance there or a ratio? I don't know um, that there's, uh, you know, you, you're preparing a course is always time, cons time, right. time consuming and you always have to prepare the assessments. Um, uh, auto grading is, is, is really uh, a key uh, te uh, key te technology to be able to scale okay. uh, the, 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 uh, so maybe the experience. I, yes. I, I probably phrase this the wrong way. It's not preparing the assessment, it's actually grading the assessment. Yes. What I can imagine would just take them. That's and, why auto grading is key to yeah. be able to scale. Um, I have some, you didn't ask, but let me share that mm -hmm. I have some, um, I guess, best practice uh, uh, design. Parameters that I that I think are good to apply when you design a course with these types of uh, delivery methods. One of them for for me is the idea of modularization. That you okay. a course needs to be a, 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 a like a Lego uh, of um, shorter uh, learning. Uh, Units okay. that can be stackable. So eventually, a course, a course in the university sense, is a semester, fourteen or fifteen weeks or whatever it is. But right. th there's no, there's, there's no reason for this except the tradition of the university experience. The calendar and on online, yeah, we don't yeah. have to right. uh, follow that same um, the, the design. So I think that for the flexibility that people want right now in the digital world, we want to make learning uh, modules that are smaller, uh, that can be stacked. A course can be made up of five, say, modules. Each module should be easy to consume within the span of a regular uh, class uh, experience in the university in two or three weeks. But if you wanted, you could binge learn in one weekend and okay. complete a module. Okay. And then what we do is each module is created by uh, a set of Jupyter notebooks that also are not too long, uh, break things down in a way that can be um, reduce cognitive load in a way, uh, but they stack up to uh, to some uh, satisfying um, uh, creation at the end. So this, the, the also, I like to feel that every learning module needs to finish with some sort of satisfying experience for the student, where they create ah, something, okay, yeah. right, with what they've learned before. Um, not just solve a problem. But, but giving okay? confidence. So giving solve a problem is, is, is that it's not as powerful as creating something. Else. Interesting. Okay. That's excellent guidance. I, I hadn't really thought about that, but it is sort of a, a maker view of it almost. Yes. Like I think the makers, the, the makers uh, uh, movement has taken some key ideas yeah. that go all the way, as you know, to Seymour Papert and... Yeah. Uh, uh, his his concept of computational thinking, and he was he was also very instrumental in the in the maker movement. But this was adopted in the the, the physical objects, but it hasn't been adopted on the software objects, right. which we could we could uh, should be able to we do could it. mimic, yeah. right? Excellent. Um, now there was a there was a birds of a feather here. Uh, you led a, a, a boff on education. And that's been a big theme here. Um, what, what was uh, some takeaways from, from the BOF here? Yes, we led a BOF with uh, Robert Halbert, a mathematics professor who also uses Jupyter Notebooks in his in teaching. And uh, uh, it, what we were sensing, and it was clear uh, during the session, was that educators using Jupiters want to connect, want to talk to each other. They want to form a network and exchange ideas, best practices, Things that go wrong, you know, make a, <laughs> a, a, a case study uh, collection of all the things that can go wrong <laughs> right. and, sh and share them ahead of time, um, and recipes for fixing those things. And uh, uh, I don't know, there were 30 people or something like that. Very animated discussions, and many concerns do come up several times, and so it's it's good to to share them, and then people have come up with different solutions that then you could, again, share. Okay. 
uh, for ways of using Jupiter in the classroom. So I think one of the key takeaways is educators using Jupiter want to be connected, want to form a community and um, uh, share best practices. Uh, is technical issues that people encounter, you know, we can share them and, and, and share their solutions to that, but those are going to be changing. I think what doesn't change is when you form a community that um, uh, learns from each other. I'm, I'm curious, I mean, in terms of the importance of community and networking, I can imagine for a lot of institutions, maybe they're not quite like Berkeley where it's, there's a big effort toward this, but a lot of institutions, this is not going to be supported necessarily from the administration on down. This is going to have to happen from individual professors. And when you have a group of individual professors from different universities that come together, then um, uh, you know you empower each other to come yeah. back and have uh, more credibility in your institution to say, mm -hmm. look, this we, we, we're, getting to, we're getting together to all these people, 60 people, whatever, in, in this meetup. And, and Everybody's talking about how the library of the university should own this and create opportunities for uh, programming, uh, for teaching programming to students or deploy Jupiter Hub within the university and so on. These different um, concerns that educators have, um, it's, in, in one university you might have one or two people, but there's power in numbers if you come together and come back with this. Uh, these messages, uh, maybe eventually we'll get some <laughs> more adoption. <laughs> I mean, case studies and, yes. and a, a, a more of the administrative figures or dollar amounts or whatever that, that can yes, be brought. So. Yes, exactly. Uh, one of the things that we learned here, we, we learned several parameters, for example, from the uh, uh, UC Berkeley team about how they set up their Jupiter Hub. Um, uh, deployment and how they observed the usage and were able to determine memory requirements per student and that is very useful for others Absolutely. to be able to come back and say well you know we have 50 students we, know we we're going to we, we need this this type of cluster to serve them with a Jupiter hub budget projections right right scaling and all that so sharing that information yeah. is vital to, for, for, for others to have a lower barrier for it for adoption oh, wonderful Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Lorena. I really appreciate it. I enjoy so much talking with you, Pat. Okay. Always. I look forward to it. <laughs> thank you.